Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for a great conversation. Next conversation is all about five generations, one workplace. Now we'll be answering the question, what does today's workplace look like? Now I think it's fair to say that over the last few years it has changed globally and at an incredibly fast and vertiginous pace, um, creating a gap between generations and co-workers. So what we'll be exploring is how generation transformation can grow from such diversity of experiences, perspectives and approaches. And when you have two global experts on the stage who are very, very well versed in this topic, it definitely promises to be an exciting conversation. I am, of course, talking about Alex Liu, Managing Partner and Chairman for Carney in the US, and Henry Rose Lee, Director and Inter a generational specialist at Tal Talentio in the UK. Um, so I think a great place to start, guys, would be just to tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you do. Alex, let's go. Me first? Okay, yeah. great. Well, first... You're uh, closest to me, why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is very energizing to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, I've been in the region for a bit now. I'm, I'm uh, visiting from Southern California, where I, I'm based, and uh, an immigrant from Taiwan, where I came to, to the US, and I'm a baby boomer dad three adult millennial children, and I lead a, a global consulting firm of about 5,000 folks, and I would say 90% of our staff is actually uh, Generation Z or millennials. I mean, we hire 1,000 uh, staff each year. We promote a similar number, and people churn out to do other great things when they come here. So I got a pretty interesting view on the topic of multi-generational Yes, um, and we will activities. be picking your brain soon. Henry. Thanks. Yes, um, I'm uh, involved in intergenerational diversity and inclusion. And as is usual with a career, it happened almost by mistake. So I had a background in sales and business development, export and import, learning and development. So you can see that's three careers already. And I decided to go into consultancy and to start speaking about five years ago. And people said to me, Leadership's been done, sales been done, learning and development has been done. Think of something different. And I looked at all the clients that I dealt with in the last 15 years and found intergenerational gaps, challenges, and issues and thought, that's where I'm going to work. So that's where I've been working for the past five years. Yes, that was kind of your, your light bulb moment. You're like, this is my purpose. This is what I want to do. Now, I am constantly reading that, you know, empowering you from all walks of life and enabling them to break down generational barriers and cut through divides and deepen the communication is more important than ever. So Henry, as someone who is more than well versed in the subject of the future of work and intergenerational transformation, what is kind of your overarching take on five generations, one workplace. Okay, my overarching take on the five generations one workplace is this. None of us likes to be labeled. So we're just labeling in this room and in this conference because this is a learning environment. So generational theory was actually formalized in the US in the 1980s by two consultants, William Strauss and Neil Howe. And they were the first to recognize that world events have an impact on every age group, every generation, but a different impact. So those sort of world events became accelerators. And those accelerators are things like war, famine, pandemic, technological advance, economic change and political change. And it was Strauss and Howe that started to look at labeling these generations. So if you take the oldest generation in the workforce today, that would be the silence, sometimes called traditionalists, sometimes called maturists. And they are in their 70s, mid 70s to mid 90s. And that's based on the world event of two world wars and the fallout and the aftermath of that. Then you've got baby boomers, and that's based on the increase in global birth rate, not in every country, but in many countries in the world after World War II. So baby boomers today are aged in their mid-50s to mid-70s. Then you've got Generation X, and I'm very sorry, Generation X, you were named after a book. And the book basically said, the youth of today don't want to work. It, you're trashed, I'm so sorry. But you're aged today between your 40s to your sort of 42 to 57. And that was Strauss and Howe that named you after a book, so I'm sorry about that. But then the label of X, Y, Z, A, B, that stuck. 
So afterwards, you've got millennials or Generation Y, and they are aged 26 to 41. And finally, Generation Z, who are in their mid-teens to their mid-20s. And that's all based on world events, you know, what was happening in the world during the years that these people were being born. So that's really the basis for generation theory. Yeah, Joe, we were just having a quick discussion backstage and it's really interesting. I was doing some work with Adobe recently and that Gen, uh, Gen Z is just not about labels at all. And for the first time in a long time, we're starting to see this labeling method as something that's quite outdated, but we're still a little bit obsessed with it, but, which is what we're going to be talking about. So is, I'm going to ask you, Alex, is there, this, is there a generational divide or is this a false narrative, you know? And if there is, what exactly does this mean? What's the truth? What's the myth, basically? I mean, I hate the labeling point as well. I mm. think uh, I would focus on the notion of one, you know, one workplace and one individual. Um, I mean, the workplaces we all and the countries that we belong to, I mean, it's a, a team of teams. And actually, diversity is a source of strength. And where you come from, your age, is just one aspect of that diversity. Um, most diversity is actually invisible. You know, what makes you tick? Mm. You know, what, how do you learn? How does your brain function? I think what I found in the teams that I've led and, and companies that I've served that are leading, trying to lead in an aspirational way their, their teams is, is to think about it that way. It's more about teamwork than about categories of people. Um, I think in the research that we've seen and I've done myself, I mean, there's a more commonality around individuals regardless of their generational heritage all the folks in the research say want to belong. They want to have a place where they can feel that they can be themselves and they can follow their individual purpose, however that's self-defined. They want flexibility. They want to feel inspired by the company and the leaders that they're working with directly, and they want to be empowered to run their workplace too, right? Whether you can work from home or whether you um, work flexibly, have different types of approaches in, in the workplace. So I, I think the generational piece is true. There are some differences in the, in the research also. I think it's true that millennials, on average, when you look at the research, are more ambitious um, and more thoughtful in many ways, uh, but they're also more willing to, you know, sort of investigate where they are, so they're more willing to leave. So there's a little bit of that. There's a level of impatience that's different across generations, but there's more similarity, I think, Lucy, in, in, yeah. than, than, than differences per se. So do you think it's fair to say this, this unrelenting desire to set these silos and these divides, that really is the problem here? Because ultimately, underlying, there is this desire to come together as one community, learning from different generations, pooling all that knowledge together, skill set. So it's, I don't know who's responsible, but it's this labeling that is ultimately creating this divide. Just one piece on that. We did some research in 2019. This was before COVID and a lot of the geopolitical uncertainty in the most recent years. And we did some research globally across all generations because we wanted to test this hypothesis. And there was a feeling of detachment and disillusionment mm. that is unrelated. It was because it was the same across all generations. People, 90% of folks go to work thinking they, they should have a great experience, right? I want to have what I call joy at work. And I wrote the HBR article on this. But by generation, by geography, by size of company, 50% of the folks are not getting it. And it's because of the matrices, the silos, too many metrics or the wrong metrics. I'm not connected. I don't really follow my lead. My leader doesn't care about, my, about me. I'm not getting enough coach. Those are the things that really matter in terms of having a cohesive workplace, not falsely putting people, you should be happy because you're in this age group, et cetera. I don't know what you think. So what would you say are some of the key factors impacting Generation Z as they kind of join and look to become leaders in today's workplace? Well, I think one of the main factors for Gen Z, if we're allowed to use the label in this room, uh, is that there is um, a lack of understanding of where they are. So what can often happen is the older we get, and you can see by looking at me, I am not a Gen Z, okay? So the older we get, what can happen is that we move further away from the very things that Gen Z are interested in, which might be innovation, novelty, variety, change. They're curious and interested. They've got energy. Of course they have. And as we age, we can get further away from innovation, novelty, variety, and change, and we move more to structure, stability, and 
and strategy. And that's a great thing. And actually, when we put them together, we get a dream team, such as you were mentioning, um, Alex, which is not really about age, but it's more about skills and, and knowledge and experience and putting ideas together. But sometimes that can happen where the two ends of those age groups get further and further apart. And what they need is to be brought together with understanding and dialogue like we're having today. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, do you have anything to add to no, that? I mean, I think uh, you know, I have a lot of experience in recruiting and talking to the next generation because that's the future of our company. Mm -hmm. uh, what I found is that the, the younger generations are very interested in understanding where they can contribute. There's a, a passion, there is an impatience, there's an urgency yes. that maybe was less in some of the older generations because if you think about the latest generation, they've grown up in a world of you know, trauma every three years, right? There was the tech bust, there was a global financial crisis, uh, there was, you know, pandemics, uh, there's geopolitical. So if you're used to that type of disorder, you want to have some sort of control. So in your workplace choice, you want to go to a place where you actually feel like you can control things. You know, I'm, I'm doing a good thing, I'm, I'm building my own skills, I'm fulfilling what I was destined to do, I'm belonging where I belong. I think uh, it, it's true that we all want that, though. I, I use this phrase that all people want to be safe, psychologically and mentally. They want to be seen for who they are, not labeled in whatever way that there are in the world. And there's so many ways you can label people. They want to be supported, right? They want to be trained. They want to be, co I mean, I, I'm in a teaching profession. We're teaching clients. We're also coaching teammates to do great things to what they're destined to be. Yeah. And then more importantly, they want to be inspired. They want to choose yeah. companies and projects and assignments and leaders, for that matter, direct supervisors that they can learn from. They, yeah. So they need all things, not just one thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So going back to the term community, which we discussed earlier, the, you know, this building of community in teams when the workplace is, you know, it's crucial, it's really important. So what responsibility then do leaders have to create this intergenerational community? Because, you know, the onus is on, on them a lot. Not, a whole, not all of it, but a lot of the responsibility does lie in the leadership. So let's talk about that. Um, that's a great question. It's also an enormous question to build community is so many things. But I think where leaders can start is with communication. And so when I work with organizations and talk to them about different age groups, one of the things that I say is, as a leader, you can't do everything, but you can start with communication. And so one of the things that you can do is, however you communicate, whether it's remotely or it's in person, you can use three questions. And leaders can ask three questions on a regular basis. So giving feedback on a regular basis is very good. And for our youngest generations, usually feedback every couple of weeks might be a phone call, might be a Zoom, might be MS Teams other platforms are available um, and as long as they get that feedback it's interesting but here are the three questions first question is what's been happening to you at work good or bad since we last spoke second question what have you learned from what's been happening good or bad since we last spoke third question how are you going to take that forward because I think what that does is it brings the leader into the area of uh, Generation Z it allows Generation Z to share what's been going on for them but then everybody is really responsible for taking it forward yeah. and with clients I talk a lot about communication hints and tips I'm a pragmatist yeah. and I like to give them things that they can actually do to move it forward so that's just one tiny idea yeah yeah what do you think about that I mean, fully agree with that I think leadership is about creating followership and one thing that was very clear to me during leadership during the pandemic was leaders are human too. Uh, they need to be accessible. They're also exhausted. They're also concerned. Uh, they need to communicate and connect people and they, they just need to be themselves. And I think a lot of people around the world, heads of state, leaders of companies, leaders of teams, they came to that realization the leaders are player coaches, right? They're, they're not any different. They have the same issues and anxieties, and they want the world to be a better place. They want their companies to succeed. They want to be better competitors, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, but they're leading teams of teams, and I think that's very important. There's, there is a, um, you know, everyone talks about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is important. I like to use the term ABC, which is allyship, which is respect for each other, mm -hmm. and really seeing each other, being empathetic, belonging, which I think is a more emotional outcome to diversity equity. If you feel like you belong, and we're all outsiders in some way, we all have blind spots, we're all different, which is a beauty. Allyship, belonging, and then the third piece, which leaders have a great deal of responsibility and power mm. to affect is culture. Uh, is it a place where people can be themselves and feel that there is no generational divide or yeah. cultural divide or racial divide or what have you? 
I love that. I think I'm going to have to steal that from you. ABC. Yeah. I really like that. And it's interesting what you say as well. You know, being heard is so important. And whatever the problem or whatever, it could be successful, it could be positive, it could be negative. Just knowing that they're being heard and any problems, issues, challenges are going to be taken care of, is, it, does, it really does work volumes, doesn't it? Mm. And I can talk personally where I work. Uh, there's not a lot of feedback, not a lot of encouragement. And it does, it really does, does slightly damage you a little bit. It really does go a long way. So, Alex, you, you've got a book coming out, um, The Joy at Work, which is also the name of your podcast, right? Um, how can Generation Transformation find joy and fulfillment at work and still meet societal and familial expectations as well? Well, I mean, I guess the first point I would say is that you should settle for nothing less than joy at work. I mean, you're born happy, your family loves you, you go to school happy, you go to your first job happy, et cetera, and then you go to work and all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm not, you know, this is, why am I here? I gotta go home to get my joy. So that's one thing, is you should set your aspiration pretty high, and then the exploration from the original Harvard Business Review article and then four seasons of podcast, where I was listening, I was learning from folks, and it's just, you know, being curious, being yourself, finding your purpose, um, working in teams, and, and there were three ingredients to that. And again, I wasn't, didn't go out trying to write a book. The editor said, this is very timely. It's, it's counter-programming to a world of, where there is no joy. There's no joy in the world. So why, how, what are you talking about joy at work? Uh, but it's really all about you know, people, purpose, and praise. Mm -hmm. Those are the three aspects. And you, people want harmony. They want acknowledgement. They want impact. Uh, seeing all the things that we talked about, Henry, earlier about the importance of people and looking at them as individuals, not as groups and as labels. Praise is more than just, you know, you did a great job. It's individualized. It is recognition. It is reinforcing a sense of belonging and a culture of belonging. And then, of course, purpose, which you have to define. You know, what is it that, you know, you're good at and what the world needs and what you're passionate about and what you can get paid for? And companies should have that same kind of logic. So that's kind of the Japanese ikigai. Right? <laughs> it's not optimizing one thing. Yeah. It's actually managing the whole diamond of trade-offs and choices. So joy at work, don't settle for anything less. You can find it at work. You should insist on leaders that believe in that because uh, we're all human and even companies need to be joyful. Yeah, do you know what, I echo something I'm constantly saying to my friends and my brother. If you're not happy at work, it's just it's gonna be impossible for you to continue happiness generally in life. It, work takes up at least 80, 85% of your time and your life, and if you're spent, spending all of that time miserable and having negative thoughts, that can have serious detrimental effects on your mental health, well-being, and just your general purpose, your, your demeanor. So that's really interesting that you said that. Um, so clearly now more than ever, you know, we need to break down these barriers between young and old in, in different ways without kind of putting those silos and labels on it um, and create new forms of dialogue that leads to, to meaningful change and lasting impact. So, Henry, how can we drive intergenerational and intercultural change and diverse discussions? I think the way that we can drive this change is by doing events like this. Actually starting the dialogue is a brilliant foundation for everything else. I think that's the first thing. I think after that, there are lots of things that leaders can do in organizations because they are in a position to support the team or the teams inside the organization so they can start the ball rolling, they can start the process. And what I would encourage them to do is, is a range of very practical steps. So mentoring and reverse mentoring, which means that uh, younger talent gets to mentor somebody who's older and more experienced, and the mentor also then uh, can, can mentor the younger, less experienced people. And it's the exchange of ideas. And I believe that intergenerational and intercultural depth and transmission of information is possible if we have co-leads on projects. They could be different ages, for example. Yes. We can rotate roles in teams. You don't just have one leader or one facilitator or one um, innovator or one person who takes the notes. You mix up the teams and mix up the roles because that creates energy and momentum as well. The other thing that I think you can do is a show and tell. I don't know if anybody has done this at school with their children, <laughs> where the child goes in and shows something about what they do. And I think that is a very simple, effective way that people can share, you know, this is what I do in my job. This is what I'm thinking about my role. And when people are put together um, in a virtual coffee meeting, if you like, or face-to-face, -face, that's great. Another thing I would suggest is let's not forget 
face to face. Uh, Leesman is the world's largest uh, engagement experience organization. And throughout uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, at the height of the pandemic, what they did was research that said there are five areas where we can create absolute connection with people face to face. Mm -hmm. It's socializing, it's learning, mm -hmm. it's collaborating, it's hosting, so hosting uh, customers, stakeholders, suppliers, teams, and it's complexity. Just think how difficult it is if you have an innovation with lots of data and you're trying to do things virtually. So those five things really support connection. And they're very practical, but they work. And I'm doing them already with my clients. And I'm finding that they really help to keep those connections and get them stronger. Yeah, honestly, can you see my face just lighting up here? They are such amazing solutions to really, like you say, create that connection and just to get everyone communicating with each other and to respect the different levels. I think all too, all too easily we're quick to put that hierarchy there. You know, the older person must be the boss. And it doesn't necessarily need to be like that. And I think there's a bit of a stigma attached to when a younger person does tell someone a little bit older what to do. So I think we need to shake that stigma a little bit before we can really accept that. But it sounds like we're moving in the right direction. It can only be a positive thing. So that's, that's really fantastic. To hear that. Do you have anything to add on that? You know, how we can drive positive intergenerational, intercultural well, I mean, um, discussions? I mean, I love the examples that you mentioned. Yeah. I think the, the leadership needs to unblock the problems uh, and, and set the tone, set the pace, set the example, set the agenda. So, I mean, I have the power of appointment. I have the power of, of communicating. How regularly? What do I talk about? Do we actually measure joy? Yes, we measure belonging. We measure engagement. Do you believe that we know what we're doing? Do you believe that your mentor cares about you? So I think asking people uh, and being a part of the team, not being up in an ivory tower or command and control. Because what's very clear in the last few years, especially during the, the global crises we all went through, is that there's a different leadership model now from command and control to what I call reflective leadership. Mm. And this is mentioned by some other academics as well, but it's listening, applying it in your own situation, and then sharing it. So I'm trying to share what I can as you are here mm -hmm. with an audience, what we've learned, but it's also applying it within the companies and cultures that you can influence as a leader. Um, but more importantly, I think being a leader means being a good teammate. What would you like me to do? I'm the captain of the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got more power than you. I've got more experience. Sure, I don't ha I've got a lot of blind spots. I don't know what's going on in this client or this team. And, uh, you know, treat me like a teammate. Yes. You know, send me emails directly, and people feel that it's a flat, meritocratic, transparent culture and people, I gotta tell you, they feel empowered. They feel more inspired when you're in a place like that where you can be seen and heard and you can influence your workplace for that matter. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. It's something that I don't I you know don't have the power to kind of lead or talk to businesses and to give them my advice but this, this inherent fear that a lot of employees have when it comes to their boss. They're scared to email, they're scared to talk to them. It, it could be something really insignificant, it could be something massive, but there's this fear of talking to the, to the CEO, to the head, to the, to the team leader, to the manager, and it just blows my mind that this is still a thing, and I've seen it happen. I saw it last week at a job that I was doing. <laughs> People were scared to tell the CEO that his shirt was creased and he needed to tuck his belly in for being on camera, and it was like, just tell him. But, you know, it, the onus is on that leader to create that comfortable environment to make sure that people feel comfortable enough to say, hey, your pot belly's hanging out, put your shirt in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're a bit short on time, so I'm going to dive into the next question. We've heard a lot about, you know, the great resignation, you know, thanks to the pandemic, and the great rethink, you know, which kind of places this emphasis on the fact that many employees are rethinking how they look at work um, and their relationship with work. But out of those and the many other greats that keep, are being bandied about at the minute, what might be here to stay and why do they matter? Um, I would say that the great that's here to stay is the great reset because whenever we have a big world event, it has an impact on how we think, how we communicate, how we buy, how we sell, how we work. And so what we've been having, having as a world event is the COVID pandemic and we can't ignore it and we're all impacted by it. So the great reset I see is that working practices are now changing. We had the technology in place for them to change before COVID appeared, but now they are going to change. We're gonna have more remote work, we're going to have the breakdown of more silos, which is great, and we're going to have more hybrid work. So I think that's a reset. And what I've been saying to all of my clients is you have a golden opportunity right now 
to organize a reset session where you talk about COVID and say, what do we think has changed? What can we learn from this? How can we take this forward and do it better, do it quicker, do it more efficiently? What can we change? And it, it's an opportunity for a discussion. And that's why I love this Generation Transformation Conference and why I'm so proud to be here. It's my first time in the kingdom. And I, I think it's an amazing place. But I think it really stands to represent what we've got as a future here. It's a great reset and we can all do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm very aware the time is screaming red numbers at me. Um, Alex, my final question. What advice would you give to young people or your younger self? <laughs> <laughs> I did this for actually for CNBC. I'll just tell you what I said, which I still think holds. Uh, one, make joy a priority, which links to purpose. You know, and number two, find that purpose. You may not know it right now, but you'll figure it out. It's intuitive. Number three, always be a constant student. You can't be a good teacher and teammate if you don't believe that you have blind spots. It can always learn, take risks. Number four, be empathetic. Emotional intelligence, situational and self-awareness is much more important than your technical skills, your intelligent, where you went to school. And number five, always be humble. You can be hungry and still humble, stay grounded, don't uh, take yourself too seriously, and you'll be more accessible and I think a better human and a better leader, potentially. Yeah, and I've got to ask, I know I've run out of time, but Henry, I've got to ask, what would your advice be? Because you're, you're such a powerful and passionate speaker, I've got to hear this. I think my advice would be to uh, have the five C's and put a picture of five C's on a board that you can see it. Um, and the five C's are cause or purpose, community, career, collaboration and contribution. So if you ask yourself a question about those five C's, what is my cause or purpose? What is my community? Have I got a career and am I enjoying it? Does it give me joy? And how am I collaborating? How can I be better at collaborating? And finally, what's my contribution? Am I contributing and making a difference? And what a fantastic sentiment to end this brilliant discussion on Alex Henry. Thank you so, so much. It's been a real pleasure. You did not disappoint. Um, give it up for my lovely panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and on that note, the three words you probably, your bellies have been waiting for. <laughs> it's time, no, four words. It's time for lunch. <laughs> we'll be back at quarter two, so make sure you're back for our next session. Thank you.